The traditional image of the British middle class. Pleasant, polite, pillars of the community. And above all, honest. You'll make some chap a good wife one day. Oh, there's nothing to it, really. But fast forward to today, and that image couldn't be further from the truth. We're going to reveal what the modern middle classes really get up to. We'll meet people you thought you could trust. Like the gentlemanly building society manager who had his own plans for his customers' deposits. A large part of the money was spent on racing tipsters, I think 1.7 million. He had shares in a number of companies that owned racehorses. The rebellious public schoolgirl who became Britain's most wanted woman. What was it like being a fugitive? It was fantastic. And the sweet suburban housewife who became a cat burglar by night. Well, I'm so sorry to everyone, I really am. For the law-breaking middle classes, Judgment Day has arrived. The British middle classes are not what they seem. Behind the veneer of white-collar respectability, there's another story, one of cheating, swindling, stealing, and rank dishonesty. Meet the middle-class criminals who are breaking the law to maintain their aspirational lifestyles, ripping off their employers. And because I trusted her so much, I never looked to her taking the money. Stealing from their customers. We have suffered so much at the hands of this man. And even breaking into homes. It became easier and easier. It was something I became good at. And these aren't isolated cases. We conducted a poll of over 3,000 people, which exposes the true extent of the problem. It reveals how the middle class are more dishonest than lower social groups. In fact, they're the new criminal class, more likely to steal from the taxman, rip off the local council, buy stolen goods, or fiddle the insurance. What drove the middle class, what defined the middle class in maybe the 50s, is not what defines the middle class now, you know, in the 21st century. In our survey, one in four middle class people thought it was acceptable to steal from the taxman. One in five would fiddle an insurance claim, if they could get away with it. More than one in 10 admitted breaking the law for personal gain. It seems the middle class are determined to hold on to the finer things in life, whatever the state of the economy and whether they can afford to pay or not. It's going to be a bottle of champagne, isn't it, really? A bottle of champagne? Dan Griffin is a university-educated wheeler dealer from Somerset who has no intention of paying back the credit he uses to finance his middle-class tastes. It's, it's, it's not cheap to live, is it? You know, it goes on lobster and bottles of champagne, flying lessons and hotels and nice things, you know, things that one needs to survive. I get overdrafts and credit cards and not be able to pay them back. Um, I owe must maybe 40 or 50 grand. I don't know. I really don't know. The old middle class respect for banks and financial institutions cuts no ice with Dan. And he's not alone. Our poll reveals that 12% of middle class people thought it acceptable to steal from large corporations. They phone you up every day and give you a load of grief, but, you know, what can they do? And they're just you know, credit card companies, and they have too much money anyway, so... I mean, the only people that really are hurt are local banks. And, you know, who cares about them? <laughs> Some may view such offences as victimless. But in this middle-class crime wave, ordinary people can find themselves in the front line. This is Arundel in West Sussex. It's a genteel and historic town which attracts antique hunters like Jane Agate to its many shops and markets. Jane was raised here and had an ideal middle-class upbringing. I suppose I had every little girl's dream when, when I was younger. Um, I had ballet lessons, which every little girl loves, uh, ponies. I definitely had the best of everything, really. Local police found themselves on the trail of an elusive criminal. A trend developed where we were experiencing a number of um, burglaries at dwelling houses in and around the villages. It was specific to a, an area of jewellery, good quality furniture, silverware, china. Mm, quite nice too. 
very quickly we recognised that we were dealing with a certain level of expertise. At the time, Jane was a 36-year-old housewife. She'd quit her job as a tax inspector to be a full-time mum. But she was feeling trapped and desperately in need of excitement. Luckily, at that time, um, my children were too young to realise what mummy was doing. Um, and I did, I did feel I was living a double life. It was, it was, it, it was two distinct personalities. By day, I was their mummy. And by night, I was taken over by, oh, it sounds dramatic to say, a dark force, doesn't it? But that's what it feels like now. Jane's downfall began after forging a friendship with a local woman. I found her fascinating because she was absolutely streetwise and I wasn't. I had no, I'd been brought up in a cocoon almost compared to her. The stuff she was telling me, you know, how, how she used to do burglaries and, and stuff, and I was thinking, oh, that sounds so exciting and so different to my life. And I was absolutely fascinated and got completely ta uh, taken in by it. And uh, I said, what's it like to do a burglary? She said, I'll show you if you like. So she did. So we, off we went in the, in the middle of the night. Actually, it was early hours of the morning. I guess it was about 10 miles. And we arrived at this house in the dead of night. She said, OK, there's a window open there. I, I was absolutely terrified. My nerves were just... But she was just blasé about it. I'm, I'm like, what do I do? She said, well, have a look round for stuff. I looked around and I'd noticed that the woman's got some really gorgeous china and that's something I'd been brought up with, so I just started wrapping the china up, we ignored the television and things. We got back in the car without being caught and we arrived back at her place without being caught. I felt guilty for finding it exciting. I knew that it was wrong. I didn't want to find it exciting, but the plain truth was that it was exciting. I don't know how I was persuaded to do it again and again and again, but it became easier and easier. And in the end, we were going out nearly every night. Jane made regular trips to antique shops in the north of England to sell what she had stolen. Because of her respectable appearance, she never raised any suspicions. It was something I became good at. We actually decided to buy trainers that were about three sizes bigger than our actual feet. If they ever find a footprint in a flower bed or something outside a window that I've got in, they're going to be looking for, you know, they're going to be looking for a man rather than a woman. I devised ways of getting into places that she didn't think about. But her confidence turned into complacency. I've parked my car stupidly on the main road in, in you know, in front of all the street lights and everything. And I've gone up to the path, I've gone into the house, I've loaded everything up. Coming back down the path, just about to hit the main road, and two policemen come towards me from the bottom. And that was it. Uh, that was me caught. For the aspirational middle classes, times are tough. People have taken on very large mortgages. Um, there is an element of trying to keep up with the Joneses, school fees to be paid, um, having big holidays. All these um, amount up to huge amounts of personal debt. Our survey shows how these pressures affect middle-class attitudes. One in six would avoid paying council tax if they could get away with it. And nearly one in five would buy something even if they thought it was stolen. Dan Griffin typifies these white-collar criminals. His expensive tastes have resulted in vast credit debts that he feels no obligation to repay. And, like 25% of middle-class people in our survey, he also thinks it's acceptable to steal from the taxman. Got sent a tax demand for some horrendous sum, you know, for, I think it was about 10,000 or something, you know. And uh, so I just thought, <laughs> whatever. I've never filed a tax return in my life. I don't know how. 
but the blurring of the line between honesty and dishonesty seems to be at its height in the workplace. According to our survey, a massive 41% of the middle class would steal from their employers if they thought they could get away with it. This is DC 1796 Kennard at Calvin Road, Bournemouth. This suburban house belonged to Carolyn Langmead, a trusted employee of AEC Electrical, a small family-run business on the south coast. When police raided it, they found an Aladdin's cave. We went to search her house. Her back bedroom was um, basically not a bedroom anymore. It, it was something like, it was like a, it was like the stock room for a, uh, a retail shopping outlet, really. Langmead had worked for the firm for a decade. After five years, she'd been trusted with the company checkbook and administered its accounts. In 2004, the once thriving company began to experience problems. Work was flourishing, but we seem to be short of cash flow. And I question this with Carolyn, and it was always the same question as, oh, we're owed a lot of money, and I'm, I'm chasing it up, we're getting it in, and um, everything will be fine. But things were far from fine. To keep his firm afloat, the boss needed to invest all his life savings, having already borrowed more than 100,000 from the bank. It was only when some bounced checks were faxed back to the firm that the manager realised why their finances were so poor. Come back into the office, um, went to the fax machine and the checks were there. And um, initially I just... Before I went into my dad and showed him, I felt sick. Gemma brought it in and it was made out to see Langmead. In fact, Langmead had written 223 company checks simply making them out to herself and cashing them locally. She'd been getting away with it for four years. The white-collar fraudster is an opportunistic fraudster. And if they look at uh, the risks of being caught, they know exactly how their organisation works. And therefore, they are managing that risk very well from day one. Langmead's carefully managed fraud had funded a marathon spending spree on around 1,500 items of designer clothing. Gucci, Prada and Louis Vuitton were among her favourites. The police found 27 bin bags full of garments, bought with stolen cheques to the value of more than £150,000. Designer boutiques loved high rolling Langmead so much, they gave her the celebrity treatment, specially opening their doors for her out of hours. Morning. She was very, very clever. And because I trusted her so much, I never looked to her taking the money. I was asking her if we can find where the money is going. After her scam was discovered, Langmead was charged with theft and dishonestly obtaining money by deception. She pleaded guilty and was jailed for four years. But middle class crime isn't just about white collar workers ripping off their bosses. They're also swindling their customers. And if you want to defraud the British public, being middle class gives you a real head start because instinctively, everybody seems to trust you. For 20 years, Graham Price had been an established member of the business community in Gowerton, South Wales. He'd run a variety of local businesses and ultimately managed a local agency of the Halifax. Jennifer Ellis was one of his customers. Everybody thought Graham was trustworthy. His total persona was one of um, quiet self-confidence. So that gave you confidence in what he had to tell you. One afternoon, Graham called me into his office and um, he said, I, I've, I've been doing um, a sort of an investment scheme for the last 18 months and it's very successful. I don't want it to be widespread. I don't want it to be widely known felt it was quite exclusive then, and, and he said it was linked to the magic word property. Dozens of other local people were also drawn into Price's property schemes. I trusted Graham. I decided to do it. Three months later, monthly interest, no problem. Did I want to do any more? He'd always come up with a different scheme, slightly different every time. Graham liked, if possible, to have the money in cash. And that would be paid into an account. 
and then he would invest it. But Price had no intention of putting any of his customers' money into property. His high-risk investment was at the bookies, where he had a weakness for gambling on the horses. A large part of the money was spent on racing tipsters. I think 1.7 million went on racing tipsters. He had accounts with various bookmakers. Uh, one of those accounts held a, a credit balance of £50,000. A substantial amount of money went on um, expensive motor vehicles. Uh, he bought two Mercedes vehicles for himself. Price managed to persuade more than 80 people to join his own bogus schemes. Because he was using the later investors to pay the interest payments on the new investors, as long as the new investors were coming through, there was plenty of money to, to pay back um, the initial investors, and they had no cause to be suspicious of the scheme, which is why they then recommended other people, and the whole thing snowballed. To sustain the fraud and fund his gambling, he needed to continue siphoning funds from Gowerton. However, resources in the modest town couldn't support his habit. So Price sought a little extra help and began stealing thousands of pounds from the Halifax. He invested half a million pounds in shares. He spent 110,000 pounds on premium bonds. Uh, he paid off his 50,000 pounds mortgage on his house. He'd invested money in four companies uh, which owned racehorses. He sustained the fraud for three years, over which time thousands turned into millions. But his massive theft was finally exposed by an internal audit. In the safe, one of the auditors found a cheeky IOU note. On the back of which was written, I, Graham Price, borrowed £7 million from the Halifax. On top of all that, Price had stolen a further £3 million from his private investors. He was jailed for 12 years. We have suffered so much at the hands of this man. I watched Graham Price on the second day of the hearing because it went over to two days. He was expressionless. His tone of voice was monotonous. He said yes to everything that the judge actually accused him of in a toneless voice. But I saw his face when he went out of that door. I can't. And it was uh, despair. It was absolute terror. And I thought, yes, we've had a year of this. It's your time now. In prison, well-spoken white-collar professionals like Graham Price stand out from regular inmates. Survival isn't easy. For someone coming in from the middle class for the first time, finding themselves in a prison population, most of whom have been there before, they will find it very tough indeed. The inmates will have a go at them. They will chivy them along. You know, they, they will attack them. And, and it's a very hard time for them. Jane Agate received a six-year jail sentence for a series of nighttime burglaries. The former tax inspector had embarked on the crime spree to escape her humdrum suburban life. I just remember the, looking at the jury and I felt like my world had ended. And the judge said, six years. And I remember thinking, oh, like that. And that was it. And the next thing I knew, I was in Holloway. I found it very frightening, I must admit. I was absolutely petrified. Apart from my father dying, that was the worst moment in my entire life. I just went completely cold and I just thought... I had two young children, I just thought, that's it, I'm not going to see them again. And then I think I just went into shock. For all the excitement and the money it gave me, there's the biggest, the biggest regret of my life. That was, I'm so sorry to everyone, I really am. The middle classes spend a fortune educating their children privately. 
They hope they'll emerge well-mannered, well-spoken, and well on their way to a career in the respectable professions. But when it comes to falling on the wrong side of the law, even the most privileged upbringing is no barrier. Now, she was the young woman with everything. Money, brains, good looks and a first-class education. But today, a dramatic fall from grace. She's gone on the run with a pilot known as the Baron after trying to fake her own death. Can you help track her down? The woman police were hunting was ex-public schoolgirl Fiona Mont. Fiona was born into an upper-middle-class family listed in posh people's Bible, De Bretz. Her mother was a senior figure in the local Conservative Party. She was accused of being part of a huge fraud involving stolen computer equipment, where suppliers and customers had been ripped off to the tune of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Fiona was interviewed by police and released on bail pending formal charges. But then her story took a dramatic turn. Rather than face being charged, she went on the run. With her pilot friend, Graham the Baron Hesketh, she escaped to the continent. The police launched a massive appeal for information in the media. During the search of the flat, we in fact found these two wigs, as you can see, as a blonde one and a redhead. Um, and as we do not believe these were for her boyfriend's use, we believe they're for her use. It obviously shows that she can change her appearance. Why can't I see anything through the lens? So look through here. Fiona may have been from a well-heeled family, but she had a taste for bad boys. Graham, the Baron Hesketh, was a convicted drug smuggler. Together, they would find love on the run. This footage is the personal record of their escapades. Where do you reckon we are now? Antwerp. Antwerp. Much of their time in Europe was spent worrying about being spotted and recognized. If there was somebody that you didn't like who was after you, would you feel safe in this house? With all those big windows and, oh, hello, I can see you, you live in a goldfish bowl. All I have to do is smash the side to get to you. If they lock the door at the front, you can get out the back, but they'd see you go out the back, couldn't they, through the windows? Back in Britain, the police were making little progress with their search. Their two fugitives always seemed to be one step ahead. We went to search two commercial containers. We expected them to be full of property, computers, uh, laptops and furniture. When we got there, they were in fact empty. Uh, and these two items were the only thing that we could uh, find in there, which was two smiley faces. Obviously, somebody's got a sense of humour. White-collar crime may be on the rise, but it seems dishonesty is down to geography as well as social status. Our survey of more than 3,000 people reveals the English middle classes most likely to break the law are in London, while those most likely to stick to it live in Yorkshire. In Scotland, they're a relatively honest bunch. But the area of Britain where most middle class citizens admit to breaking the law for personal gain is Wales. Wherever they live, the reasons for dishonesty are often the same. I spoke to a couple of people who had stolen because they wanted to protect their status. They were defined as uh, respectable people, either in their family or amongst their peer group, and they committed fraud, ironically, to protect that position. The classic middle-class crimes are fraud. They are, they are crimes where you never come face to face with the victim. It was an alleged fraud involving stolen computers that brought ex-private schoolgirl Fiona Mont to the attention of police. After detectives pulled her in for questioning, she went on the run and fled abroad. Fiona has never told her story before, but we tracked her down, and tonight she breaks her silence for the first time. Lots of people along the way have said, what was it like being a fugitive? It was fantastic. It was, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant to to be free of them, and um, I thought that's an end to it. <laughs> Fiona had attended a £7,000 a year private school, but that's where her trouble started. Private school was horrible. They were definitely, definitely trying to mould us into a particular image, the same image, 
I was also very shy and very quiet, and it built and built and built and built, and it exploded when I was 14. Fiona's rebellion against her privileged upbringing eventually led her into the arms of convicted drug smuggler Graham the Baron Hesketh. On the run, she kept ahead of the police by staying on the move and sleeping in a caravan. With Hesketh, she traveled through Holland, France, and then Spain. When I asked him if he would come with me, he said yes, straight away, without hesitation. From our point of view, it's a love story. Back in the UK, police accused the couple of taunting them, sending letters poking fun at detectives working on the case, along with a fake check for one million pounds. The latest back in England is that uh, apparently we've been sending taunting emails to the police. The fact they were saying I was taunting them, it was quite the reverse, I wasn't. Police were trying to use the press to get a reaction because they might get a trace or a track on where we were. And I was adamant that I wasn't going to give them that, I wasn't going to give anything away. Fiona was so elusive, the media nicknamed her the cat. But after three years on the run, she finally ran out of lives when Detective Constable Steve Skerritt caught up with her. Steve Skerritt came into Spain and had me arrested in Spain. Fiona was thrown into a Spanish jail to await extradition. The blankets were alive with lice. I could feel them crawling all over my face. And the place was just like a lunatic asylum. Just exactly what was it that I did that has justified or in any way excused this? I mean, are there, are there crowds of people back in England cheering that I'm being arrested? After 40 days in jail, Fiona had a surprise visitor. And my name was called out on the tannoy. And this boy in jeans and a T-shirt said, um, uh, who was there with court's papers, he said, um, you're free to go. And I, you know, I had to make him repeat it several times. I couldn't believe it. And he said, you're free to go. You can go home. It's still unclear why Fiona was released by the Spanish authorities. But British police say that somewhere along the line there was an administrative mix-up. Fiona has always denied her guilt, and to this day she's never been charged. Since being on the run, she and Hesketh have married and had two children. But memories of being a fugitive are still vivid. After a few uh, weeks back, I thought, I'm a bit worried maybe they'll still come, so I'll ring them. So I rang the chief constable's office and I spoke to a lady there, and she said, Fiona who? <sighs> After all that. Stories like Fiona's may grab the headlines, but millions of cases of middle-class dishonesty go unreported, and they cost the country billions of pounds each year. High on the list of offenses and non-payment of fines, especially those issued by local authorities for illegal parking. In fact, more than 10% of those questioned in our survey thought it acceptable to steal from the council. I mean, I have, I have a few parking tickets. I think 20 at the last count, maybe 25. I don't know. I just lost count. You know, there is a considerable sum that they're wanting from me, but I find it unacceptable to pay it. Absolutely, totally, totally unacceptable. So I don't pay him. In common with 20% of middle class people, Dan also thinks it's acceptable to exaggerate insurance claims. I had a car stolen once when I was in Oxford, and I claimed on the insurance for it to, uh, to get the window fixed and the dashboard put back together. And then um, I lied about it and said that I had a camera that, that there as well. You know, it wasn't very much, but you know, I mean, I'm sure the insurance company wouldn't have been too pleased if they knew about it. We've seen how a desire for money can lead to middle-class crime. But there's another motivation, and it's equally powerful, whatever your social group. No matter whether you're the richest man on earth or the poorest man on earth, everybody has the same 
vices. And the vices, one of the vices is sex. Alec Bromley was targeted by a man driven by that vice. It would cost him and his Bolton furniture business a fortune. This one's a Duresta suite. This is three and a half thousand pounds, going up for 500 quid. Bargain. Alec decided to hire an accountant to help with his expanding business. The man he took on, Michael Lee, couldn't have had more impeccable credentials. One thing that impressed me at the interview with Lee <clears throat> was his CV. <clears throat> a qualified uh, accountant. Uh, also, he was a magistrate down in London. The ex-city accountant started work as Alec's bookkeeper. I got on very well with Mike Lee. I trusted the guy. Uh, I accepted his uh, advice and, um, and I felt quite comfortable that he was um, looking after us. His driver would go out, deliver the suite, and it would be cash on delivery. The driver would come back with the, uh, the money and give it to Lee, or give it to Alec, who would then give it to Lee. So I could be having two or three thousand pounds a day coming in and out of the office, and of course that needs to be banked. Lee was responsible for the banking of that. Um, I used to just come in and give him the money, and then in good faith that he would then deposit in the post office. But Lee had a secret. Behind closed doors, he had a weakness for watching a woman clean his house, wearing nothing but a pair of rubber gloves. And he was willing to pay for it. In her account, she said that what she would charge was anything, but it was about £200 an hour for her company. Although Lee never laid hands on her, he was addicted to the thrill. He blew £160,000 of his own savings on her, and ran up a further 60,000 in credit. She said he would take her to London, he would buy her meals. Um, she claimed that he paid for um, a breast implant operation for her. She claims to have um, cleaned up for him when he told her to. There's certainly no evidence of the house being clean. He was giving this girl more and more money and he couldn't get any more money from anywhere else. So what was he left with? He was left with Alec and his cash-rich environment. Top quality semi and aligned leather. Lee began fiddling the accounts and paying himself out of Alec's takings. Most fraudsters uh, will start by uh, passing through a small invoice, a relatively small check, and they will see whether the systems and controls pick it up. And then they'll get braver. They'll understand that that hasn't been checked or found out, and as a result, the fraud will just tend to escalate from there. Lee continued stealing for four years before he was found out. When detectives broke the news to Alec, he was stunned. Over a period of 18 months, he's embezzled from your business between 160 to 280,000 pounds. Did you know anything about it? I said, well, that's, you know, I said, that's it, isn't it? All the colour drained from his face. He was a broken man that day. Yeah. And it was just, uh, he ruined my day. Ex-magistrate Michael Lee's middle-class credentials didn't keep him out of prison. He was sentenced to two years. I'll tell you one thing, I do all the banking these days. <laughs> In studies of white-collar crime, there are recurring themes. A desire to better oneself and a craving for social status. This is Tomantow, the highest village in the Scottish Highlands. It's known as the gateway to the Cairngorms, noted for its fishing and wildlife. Well, Tomantow is a, a planned village that was uh, set up oh, over 250 years ago, and I don't suppose it's changed all that much since. But life here took a dramatic turn with the arrival of a man who seemed to be at the very pinnacle of the social ladder. He was an impeccably mannered English gent who'd fallen in love with the village and wanted to invest in it. He had a title, Laird Anthony Williams, and he had cash. He bought the Gordon Hotel, which was the Gordon Arms Hotel. He then bought the old souvenir shop, um, which is now the Clock House Restaurant. Uh, he then bought the cottage at the end of the village, um, which he then renovated. Overnight, the place was sort of scaffolded, teams of builders arriving, and the whole place was a hive. It was, you know, money was no object. The renovations that Tony did were to the highest standard that anyone locally had ever heard of. There were rumours about the 
gold-plated bath taps in the cottage and things like that. How true, I have no idea. And, and it, it became the talk of the village. It was a, a, a wonderful thing that had happened. You just didn't get investment like that in a little village on that scale. And we all wondered what was going on. Laird Williams poured three million pounds into the tiny community, earning popularity and respect. He basked in his high social status. He was, he was the lord of the manor. He was the laird of Tom and Tal. We want people to evaluate us positively. Social affirmation and getting uh, the kind of social rewards of acceptance and uh, of praise and uh, people thinking you're a, you're a good person. These are extremely powerful uh, reinforcements to individuals. Very, very private man. But I always knew that there was something behind him. He was worrying. You could see he was a worried man. We all felt that there was something not quite right, but nobody could put their finger on it. As Williams continued to lavish money on the village, delight turned slowly to suspicion. The Laird's regular trips to the local bank seemed more than a little unusual. He came up once um, in his uh, XJS car with a couple of carrier bags in the back, you know, quite clearly, quite obvious to the people in the know what, what was in those bags. He really did have a large amount of money in those bags. Alerted to Williams's unusual banking practices, the police began to investigate. And when the case ended up at Scotland Yard, the name Anthony Williams seemed strangely familiar because he worked there as Deputy Director of Finance. Williams, an accountant, had been trusted to oversee a pot of money which was supposed to fund a secret aircraft for spying on terrorists. Instead, he'd used it to climb the social ladder. The lesson it kind of gives the Yard and any organisation is that no matter how secret, no matter how important something is, you never let one person control it. There has to be checks and balances. Two or three people need to know what's going on. The most damning evidence uh, about crime that's committed in organisations is that people say they do it because it was easy. And having got used to the money, they continued, until the point, of course, when they got caught. Williams certainly got used to the money. During the course of his fraud, he diverted more than £5 million of public funds into his private accounts. People have to be trusted. It's part of doing uh, business, doing an organisation's work. And, of course, people in higher positions in the organisations have greater trust placed upon them, are often a lot less visible, they're much more autonomous, access to greater amounts of information and resources and money. And clearly, when they abuse that trust, the consequences can be much more severe. And for Williams, the consequences were severe. He was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. And after his release, the once wealthy laird from the Highlands began a new career as a South London bus driver. We've seen how middle-class professionals are using their detailed knowledge of corporate systems and accountancy procedures to commit huge frauds. It's a crime wave that's costing Britain billions of pounds a year. But the educated middle classes aren't just using their financial skills to break the law. They have all kinds of other talents. Ex-public schoolboy John Myatt's crimes were down to knowledge of the art market and a deft hand with a paintbrush. I was broke. I've got uh, troubled domestic circumstances and two little ones to, to take care of. I, I needed money. John, a talented artist, took on a seemingly innocent £200 commission where he painted a picture in the style of Matisse. But the buyer later returned and announced that he'd had the painting valued as an original for around £25,000. He, uh, he offered me a, a half of the money that he could get for it. Uh, and I think if that had just been a one-off, um, that, that would have been that. But in fact, it led to a relationship that went on for far too long. The pair began an art forgery scam that is estimated to have netted more than a million pounds. John churned out more than 200 paintings and had a novel way of making them look old. Well, this is a Picasso from around about uh, 1911, 1912. It started off being seated nude, but it's ended up being a harlequin. <laughs> anyway, it will look a little bit too new when it's, when it's varnished, so something you can easily do at home is take a nice hot cup of coffee, quite strong, black, and here we go. 
Now, ideally, it wants to be stronger than that, but this will give you the effect. Can you just look at the kind of lovely, dense brown effect we're getting through here? Isn't that lovely? In a minute, I'm going to... I'm going to stand it upright, because what will happen is that as I stand it up, the coffee, as it goes down, will catch the tooth of the canvas. Now, as that comes down, what it should do is start to just give the impression of... See, here it comes. Just give the impression of uh, just d general clean dirt over the ages. It's not a crime to paint this. It's not a crime to sign this, to sign this uh, Braque or Picasso. Uh, it's a crime to sell it to you as a Braque or Picasso. Quick drying household paint mixed with KY jelly enabled John to produce a finished forgery once every six weeks and unbelievably still fool the buyers. It was unreal, I think. It was a bit like watching a spaceship land on the lawn, you know, and, and, and take off again. And, and, and sort of going down the pub and saying, you never guess what you're doing. I mean, it just, it was that silly. It was silly. It was unreal, I think, how the, the getting paid for, because the quality of what I was doing, frankly, was just uh, grim. It wasn't good. <laughs> I walked out of uh, an auction one day. I went, walked up King Street in London and I watched three of my four of my paintings go through and I'd listened to the auctioneer describing them. And I thought to myself, why do I feel, why do I feel so crap about this? And it was that, it was just then that I thought, I'm not doing this anymore. So I stopped. And when I stopped, of course, in my naivety, I thought, well, that's it now, you know, all over, that's good, okay, we'll go and do something else. I can't go back to teaching, I think. And, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I felt quite surprised with the police search warrant, you know. Um, I just thought it seemed to be very unfair to me that they got me when I'd stopped doing it. John was sentenced to one year's imprisonment for the fraud. What did they say in Brixton? Welcome to the second worst prison in the United Kingdom. So, oh, thanks a lot. I remember saying to this guy, where's the library? There was a cardboard box on the floor about the size of that. I said, that's the library. <laughs> oh, God. Come on. The truthful thing about prison is it is exactly the same as the world out here, the world you're in right now, except the nice people are much nicer and the nasty people are unbelievably much nastier. John was released after four months. Do I think I got punished severely? No, I think I got it extremely lightly. I was, uh, I was very lucky there was police officers walking outside the corridor in the Southwark Crime Court saying, you're going to get six years. After his release, the same skills that got John into trouble in the first place helped him to rehabilitate. He's now a commercially successful artist, selling legitimate paintings that he openly declares as fakes. Some of them fetch tens of thousands of pounds. Guilt, I say I did a bad thing, I went to prison, I paid a lot of money back to them. And that's it, it's over. In this programme, we've met fraudsters, forgers, swindlers and their victims. Everybody thought Graham was trustworthy felt sick. I'll tell you one thing, I do all the banking these days. It's a situation that's showing no sign of coming to an end. And these crimes will affect everyone in Britain. It isn't victimless crime. No, no crime is victimless, truly victimless. I think we all end up paying. In the front line will be Britain's businesses, from large corporations to small family outfits. For every a pound of detected fraud. Some surveys show that eight pounds is undetected. There should be auditors which check uh, financial expenditure. And uh, I spoke to one of the offenders about how he got round this, and he called the auditors a bunch of muppets. The cost of borrowing, etc. All these pressures coming in is going to kind of squeeze their lifestyle. And I think you will see more people who are in positions of trust letting that moral wall down, you'll see the kinds of crimes that they perceive to be victimless.